Please welcome Dan Flatley, National Security Reporter from the Bloomberg News. He will be moderating today's discussion. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, good afternoon and, and welcome to our discussion of the U.S.-China trade and technology conflict hosted by Carnegie Mellon University and the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. My name is Dan Flatley, and I cover national security for Bloomberg News with a focus on economic issues. So I just wanted to start with a couple of data points before we turn to our panel of distinguished experts who can help frame, critique, and offer suggestions about this very important topic. A Pew Research study released last week shows that 83% of U.S. adults have a negative view of China, yet trade between the two nations is at or near an all-time high. And a Bloomberg report released today based on IMF data shows China will be the top source of global, global growth over the next five years. Business executives are continuing to travel to China to promote their interests, even as national security hawks here in DC are warning about the dangers they see ahead in the relationship. So the central question before us would seem to be whether the US and China can manage their competition in a productive way or allow these tensions to lead to potentially catastrophic consequences. We'll hit some major themes along the way, including lessons learned from Chinese industrial policy, the effectiveness of export controls and tariffs, the rise of trade tensions, and the idea of, quote, selective decoupling, unquote. To start us off, and by way of introduction, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to say a bit about themselves and address how their particular research can help to answer the main question. Let's start with Lee Branstetter of Carnegie Mellon, who can help us frame the overall issue by talking about the origins of the U.S.-China trade and technology conflict. Lee? Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'm Lee Branstetter. I'm a professor of economics and public policy at Carnegie Mellon's Heinz College. I'm also a research associate at the MBER and a non-resident senior, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics. Uh, there have been tensions in the U.S.-China trading relationship for decades, but I want to focus on the intensification of conflict that emerged in the Trump administration and has continued to some extent in the Biden administration. I'm going to focus on the economic aspects of this, um, and I'll leave it to Jason, Matheny, and others uh, to focus on the national security implications. So former President Trump and many U.S. policymakers have focused on the U.S.-China bilateral trade deficit. Uh, as an important source of the problem, but from an economic standpoint, that doesn't make a lot of sense. The overall U.S. trade balance is determined by macroeconomic forces that have relatively little to do with trade. Uh, we run bilateral surpluses with some trading partners and bilateral deficits with others, and um, you know these these don't really matter, right? And this is not a problem uh, from an economics perspective that the U.S. government needs to solve. Others have pointed out that China-based producers have become very uh, competitive producers of some goods, and this has forced some painful adjustments elsewhere, including in the U.S., but economic research shows that the benefit that U.S. consumers and firms get from access to relatively high-quality, low-priced Chinese goods outweighs the cost of these adjustments. So that's not the problem either. But it's one thing if Chinese producers attain this export success because of the diligence of the workers, the foresight of their managers, and the quality of their technology. It's another thing if the Chinese government is tilting the playing field in favor of its own firms, its own national champions through market intervention. This in principle could lead to distorted markets. It could lead to economic harm to the US, to the rest of the world, and even to China itself. So from an economic standpoint, this is the problem. And the China's economic system offers many ways through which it can tilt the playing field in favor of its national champions. Uh, it can give subsidies um, or tax breaks uh, to favored firms, just like Western governments do, but it can also order the biggest banks in China, which are state-owned, to lend to targeted firms and industries on favorable terms. It can direct the state-owned enterprises that dominate large chunks of the Chinese domestic economy to favor its national champions. Uh, against other rivals, foreign and domestic. It can force foreign firms to transfer technology to indigenous firms, even when that runs contrary to WTO rules. And all of this uh, can function as a subsidy that privileges selected Chinese firms over rivals. American and Western policymakers had hoped that as the Chinese economy matured and developed, 
uh, that China would begin to step away from these kinds of interventions. But China's critics say that that really hasn't happened. Um, efforts to tilt the playing field have continued, they've intensified, they've grown more ambitious, at least according to the critics, and now they're targeting the areas in which Western firms have a comparative advantage. So how has the U.S. responded? Well, the Trump administration launched a range of tariffs against Chinese products, but most trade policy experts don't think that these were terribly well targeted. A lot of the firms and products that were hit by these tariffs were being produced by multinational corporations based in China that were following the rules. And many Chinese firms that were benefiting from subsidies or other instruments of in industrial policy but don't export much to the US got off scot-free. Um, so the Biden administration has maintained the Trump tariffs, uh, but it's also embraced tighter export controls, investment restrictions, and industrial policies of its own, in part to counter what China is doing. And what many of us fear is that the relatively open trading and investment system the US and its allies have carefully built up over the post-war era could be torn apart as China and the West engage in a kind of arms race of escalating government intervention. China subsidizes, so we subsidize. China restricts market access, so we impose tariffs. China uh, forces technology transfer, so we impose export controls. And just like the arms race of the Cold War era, both sides could potentially lose if this keeps escalating and neither side achieves much of an advantage. So can the US and China negotiate their way out of an arms race of escalating market interventions? This may be a little easier if good research shows that the interventions implemented by both sides often have very costly side effects and often fail to completely meet their goals. And my fellow panelists have produced much outstanding research that can support that position. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, next, we have Pandler Barwick of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who has done groundbreaking research into Chinese industrial policy in the shipbuilding and auto industries. Pandler, can you tell us a bit about your research and help us understand the question of where and how industrial policies, including subsidies, work and where they fail? Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, uh, so I'm Pamela Barwick, professor at the economics department of UW Madison. I'm also a faculty research associate at MBER. So, um, traditional economic justifications for industrial policies are market failures, broadly defined, such as innovations that generate positive spillovers and environmental externalities. If we look around the world, the outcomes of industrial policies are often mixed. Hence, it's important that we study other countries' experiences. China has been a prominent the proponent uh, of industrial policies. So um, it's, you know, I think it helps if we study their experiences. Take shipbuilding as an example. In 2000, China's world market share in ocean transport um, ship production was less than 8%. Since, since 2003, and especially 2005, China adopted shipbuilding a strategic industry and implemented aggressive industrial policies that targeted all stages of ship production. China's market share skyrocketed and became the largest shipbuilding country in 2009, accounting for 40% of ship orders worldwide. On the surface, this policy was very successful. There was an entry boom. The aggregate industry investment in 2007 was four times the size in 2005. Upon closer look, however, the, the policy was very wasteful, especially in the early years. To attract firms to ship production, the central and local governments used a variety of policy instruments. We break them um, into three buckets. So this is a research done with my collaborator, Mirto Kalupsidi at Harvard and Nahim Zahar um, at Queen's University. So we, we capitalize the policy in instruments into three buckets, entry subsidies, where the government gave out land often at heavily discounted prices and simplified the registration procedure. And second bucket is a production subsidy where the government, des for example, the government designated the banks to provide buyer financing since ships are large commodities uh, that costs cost hundreds of uh, you know, millions of dollars. 
provided cheap materials such as steel and refunded value added tax. And third buckets, investment subsidies, where the government allowed expedited capital depreciation and issued low, int low interest loans. Our findings suggest that entry subsidies are particularly wasteful. One dollar of subsidy only generated 30 cents of industry profit. Note that I said profit, not revenue. The reason is that entry subsidies attract low, high cost and low efficiency firms who, who could only survive when pampered by the government. While the industry boomed with no many firms producing ships, the increased industry output and revenue were financed by taxpayer money. The industry profit increased by much less than government subsidies. And another side effect is the industry is also highly fragmented. Um, so while um, so while the inefficient firms can survive with government support and a favorable macro environment where ship prices kept increasing from the early 2000s to 2008, they can't weather any significant business cycle, which is typical in manufacturing industries. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, many of these entrants were the first to lose production orders and became bankrupt. So the central government quickly realized that entry subsidies were generating excessive entry and, and issued an entry ban in 2009 that essentially banned entry outright. And they also implemented policies that is targeted firms more directly. Obviously, many of the firms are efficient, but also state-owned enterprises. Uh, and, and in 2014, the government issued a white list which essentially the, the firms have met industry standards. Um, and this is a policy that the government used to channel funding and subsidies toward firms that meet the industry requirement. Our study suggests that entry subsidies are very wasteful. The other three, you know, production subsidies, the investment subsidies and wireless subsidies, you know, do much better. We showed that these policies are more likely to be taken up by efficient firms which is also intuitive. You know, if firms have a large number of buyers, then the production subsidies in the form of buy financing would help. And those firms turned out to be efficient and producing high quality products. In other words, the first lesson we learned is a successful policy should avoid attracting or subsidizing underperforming firms. Another important lesson is that industrial policy should take into consideration business cycles. If you subsidize when the industry capacity utilization is already or at or close to peak, further expansion is going to be very costly. In contrast, in downturn, plants are idle. Expanding production mobilizes underutilized capacity and is much more efficient. The third lesson we learned is that industrial policies need to consider the duration of a policy, even if the government average spending remains the same. Industrial policies induce distortions. You know, by construction, by design, the, they're, they are chosen to change firm behavior and has long-term implications in China and actually in many Asian countries. One long-term implication is access capacity and fragmentation. So while we hope to use industrial policies to correct market failure, or in some recent cases, help with national security, it's important to take, keep in mind that those policies generate their own distortion and inefficiencies. So if we pan perform firms for too long, we end up sustaining inefficient firms and preventing the resources being reallocated to good firms through market forces. Thank you. Thank you, Pandler. That was great. Um, next up, we have Jason Massini from uh, the RAND Corporation, president and CEO. And I'd like to invite Jason to talk a little bit about the national security dimension of some of these issues. One thing that uh, particularly I've been interested in is how this has moved from the realm of economics, uh, these trade tensions from the realm of economics to the realm of national security. And uh, I'd like Jason to, to talk a little bit about that if he's willing to do so. Great, thanks so much, Dan. Um, I'll focus on semiconductors since I think it's one of the most active areas of discussion at this intersection of economics and security. 
Um, first, I'll describe some of the recent export controls on semiconductors that Lee mentioned. I'll describe their motivation, some of their costs, and some of their benefits. And then I'll describe some possible future approaches that could potentially maintain the benefits, but at lower cost. So in October of last year, the Department of Commerce set new export controls focused on the most advanced chips used in computing. Um, the controls affect less than 5% of U.S. chip exports to China and under 1% of all exports to China. Um, and there are comparable controls on the manufacturing equipment that's used to make leading edge chips uh, that affect less than 5% of manufacturing uh, in China. Still, though, such controls do reduce near-term revenues for U.S. chip companies and for uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment companies. Um, the controls were motivated by security concerns that I think can be binned into three categories. Um, first, the PRC government's uh, cyber activities. Uh, second, its human rights abuses. And third, its risk to Taiwan. Um, first, China's military and intelligence services have for years used uh, offensive cyber operations to conduct industrial espionage, appropriating advanced technologies from the U.S. and elsewhere. And increasingly, these cyber operations have depended on large data centers that are built with U.S. hardware. Second, China's internal security services have for years been building very large data centers for surveillance of its own population. Um, U.S. hardware had been the primary enabler of scaling China's surveillance systems. And as one example, the Xinjiang data center that's used for real-time video surveillance of the Xinjiang prison camps was built using U.S. chips. Third, China's leadership views reunification of Taiwan as a national priority and is preparing for reunification by force. That would certainly be a catastrophe for the 23 million inhabitants of Taiwan, uh, but it would also be a catastrophe for the rest of the world. Uh, by some estimates, comparable in economic costs to the Great Depression due to Taiwan's centrality in global supply chains. And the cyber and kinetic weapons that China's military would use against Taiwan have depended on U.S. hardware. Uh, fifth, the things that I've described represent negative externalities of U.S. computing hardware that's sold to China. The U.S. chip companies don't pay for China's intellectual property theft against other companies or for human rights abuses or for the consequences of a Taiwan invasion. Uh, other parts of society pay for those externalities. Um, at the margins, does the benefit then of these semiconductor export controls exceed the cost? Well, the current costs of the controls uh, to U.S. chip and equipment companies are in low single-digit billions per year. So this is a really hard question about the value that one assigns to the PRC government's cyber operations, to its IP thefts, to its human rights abuses, and the probability that one would assign to a Taiwan scenario and how much each of those scenarios is increased by having access to leading edge chips uh, compared to chips that are several years old. Um, but to me, it seems likely that the benefits exceed the costs uh, for those controls, especially as we see the power of large AI models that are enabled by these leading edge chips. A nuclear analogy is that a cyber weapon is a nuclear warhead. Uh, the chips are the fissile material. Semiconductor manufacturing equipment is the centrifuges. Um, in the nuclear domain, centrifuges and fissile material can be used peacefully for nuclear energy, but we accept that the risks of misuse are sufficiently severe that we need limits on the material and technologies. And we have requirements for monitoring to ensure benign use. Um, like nuclear technologies, computing is a powerful dual-use technology that requires guardrails. And in effect, that's what the October 2022 uh, controls aimed at, which is a non-proliferation regime uh, for advanced computing. Uh, benign computing research in China can continue since researchers can use cloud computing systems outside the country, but military and police organizations are unlikely to send data outside the country. So the control regime has this attractive property that it's likely to reduce misuse while minimally affecting um, benign use. A more precise control mechanism could be one that uh, has the point of control not in cloud computing providers, but in the chips themselves. For instance, chiplets that are embedded in AI chips to prevent the chips from being used to train cyber weapons or bioweapons or massive surveillance systems. Um, that would have a lot of potential benefits. Effectively, it would be 
programming fissile materials so that it can be used for civilian energy and not for bombs. Thanks, Jason. Um, that was great and uh, really appreciate your perspective on, on, on this issue. Um, and finally, I'd like to invite uh, Shangjin Wei of Columbia University to speak a little bit about his research, uh, help us understand the US-China trade tensions and uh, a, a bit about Chinese technological innovation and, and where things are likely to go from here. Uh, so Shangjin, please take it away. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm Shang Jing Wei, Professor of Economics at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. So I'm going to say a few words uh, uh, each about the U.S.-China trade tension uh, and uh, 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 industrial policies uh, in China, potential implications for, for other countries. Uh, on the uh, uh, trade uh, uh, tensions, let me say two things. Well, one, let me echo uh, what Professor Brandstad uh, said uh, early, which is the obsession with bilateral trade deficit of the US uh, against uh, China uh, might be uh, overblown. I, I should point out, you know, uh, you know, there are multiple sources of tension underlying the bilateral trade relationship. US deficit vis-a-vis -vis China is one. Uh, the other is a sense that uh, China is a severe rule breaker of global trading uh, system and both have contributed to the uh, poll uh, result that uh, was referenced uh, earlier about uh, negative views uh, towards China and, and reducing the scope of, uh, uh, of uh, cooperation. So, so bilateral deficit of US against China, uh, I think uh, 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 is, uh, is uh, overblown, partly because if you look at the US trading relationship with 200 or so economies in the world, US runs a trade deficit, deficit against most countries, about two thirds or so. Uh, countries. Uh, so China is not, uh, does not stand out in that regard uh, as a trading partner. In, in fact, before China became a significant uh, uh, trading nation uh, 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 you know, prior to 2000, 2000 uh, US also ran a very large deficit, not just against uh, Japan, but against most of, of its trading partners. This supports many economists' uh, uh, view that a country's deficit uh, is mostly determined by deeper structural factors. In the US case, relative shortage of savings uh, compared to uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, investment. So once we, why is that important? Once we realize this, this will put bilateral deficit uh, into, uh, into uh, perspective. And, uh, and this, the other thing about uh, uh, China being the uh, severe rule breaker in global trading system, therefore we have to do something dramatic uh, to sort of carve China out of, of this. Why Chinese uh, record uh, in compliance with global trading rules uh, uh, is far from perfect. Let's not exaggerate that. So, so this is the area where we don't have to deal with few right kind of uh, uh, sentiment. We can look at the data. Uh, at the uh, world trading uh, system, one uh, very useful way to look at how often a country, a member country breaks rules in the eyes of other WTO member countries is to look at how many cases lodged against a given country by other WTO members. Since China joined WTO, uh, there were about uh, 46, 47 cases lodged against China. Is, is this a large number or small number? Well, that's roughly in proportion to Chinese uh, trading volume uh, in the world uh, trading volume. As a comparison, during the exact same period, there are roughly twice as many cases lodged against the United States. Uh, by other member countries. Most of the cases lodged against the United States are not by China, but, but by other, uh, other countries. That's actually more than US share in global trading system. This is not, a, this is not to say that uh, Chinese uh, uh, compliance with global trading law uh, is, uh, is perfect, far from it. This is to point out, in fact, virtually no country's record uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, per perfect. And Chinese challenge to the global trading system is no more problematic, perhaps not dramatically more problematic than other large uh, countries. So for example, today, world trading system uh, is not functioning, partly because uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the top system adjudicating trade disputes uh, uh, at the WTO is not functioning. If you ask what WTO, other WTO members, you know, which country is most responsible for this, most, most people will tell you that it's the US choice to refuse to uh, renew and appoint uh, judges on the uh, dispute, the settlement mechanisms that sort of uh, dis uh, disables the WTO uh, rules. This is with, so, so, so to, to summarize, 
uh, even in that area. So in fact, uh, um, there's perhaps more scope than we commonly understand uh, for cooperation among US, China, Europe, and other countries to rebuild global trading system, uh, to reform WTO rules, and to uh, return to a more uh, 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 rules-based uh, global uh, global trading system. So that's on uh, uh, managing bilateral uh, uh, trade. Perhaps we should be more optimistic than, uh, than uh, uh, commonly understood. On industrial um, uh, uh, policy, so first let me point news. Let's start with a, a, a note in history. Industrial policy uh, was not invented in China. It was invented in the United States. It was not invented recently. It was in, invented essentially at the time when United States was founded uh, in, uh, in, in, in the uh, late 18th centuries. Uh, in fact, uh, the very first uh, Secretary of uh, Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who I should note is a graduate of Columbia University or King's College, the predecessor to Columbia uh, University, uh, uh, invented the uh, in, intellectual policy, the intellectual uh, father of this uh, idea. He proposed uh, U.S. to use industrial policy to compete with then leading industrial power of the world, uh, Great uh, uh, Great uh, Britain. Now, now you know nowadays uh, industrial policy is back in vogue uh, again. Uh, here in this country, United States, we see uh, you know various uh, policies that openly promote the industrial policy, partly to compete with China. I mean, we have a there's a, a, a apparent a strategy of uh, uh, out China China uh, using what understood uh, here to be Chinese strategy to do things here in order to compete more effectively uh, with China. Um, and uh, in order to do that, you know, one, one can make a case that in principle, sometimes a laissez-faire uh, equilibrium uh, in a laissez-faire outcome uh, in a market economy uh, doesn't always give you socially optimal uh, outcome. Uh, for example, in innovation context, there's spillover from innovations we might be able to build a case for uh, public sector uh, uh, intervention. But here I want to uh, say that we need to be really uh, cautious about this because uh, when you have government uh, uh, intervention, there can be uh, also uh, negative consequences, some perhaps intended, some perhaps uh, unintended, uh, intended meaning there can be lobbying, corruption, and those that systematically trying to, you know, private sector firms trying to systematically expropriate public resources for their own. Uh, benefit, uh, benefits, but sometimes they, they can be uh, un unintended. They uh, also need to be recognized and will have a uh, major consequence for the success or failure of industrial policy. So let me be a bit more concrete. So uh, to complement uh, what Professor uh, Barwick uh, said earlier, Professor Barwick talked about the steel uh, industrial policy and shipbuilding policy of China. Uh, here I'm going to um, mention about the pro-innovation industrial policy, a, a recent uh, 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 you know, subject of my own uh, uh, research. China has multiple pro-innovation industrial policies in the last few uh, decades. Uh, and data seems to show that Chinese uh, patent have exploded so much so that now in a given year, uh, there are more uh, Chinese patents filed by Chinese firms than US patents. So based on their record, it seems like China has become very innovative and perhaps more innovative uh, if you only look at the patent count uh, than, the, uh, than the US. Uh, and industrial policy seems to play a role. So, so uh, one of the largest pro innovation industrial policy of China uh, is to offer selected firms that are deemed to be very innovative a very large subsidy in the form of a reduction in corporate income tax by uh, 10 percentage points. That's a huge uh, subsidy to those uh, firms that. Uh, from the receive uh, this. However, my research suggests uh, that looking at the explosion of the pattern perhaps is a long way to judge success or failure of, uh, of this uh, industrial policy. Our research suggests that most of the incremental patterns and other innovations that are inspired or triggered by the industrial policy are of low quality type. How do we know it's, uh, they are low quality? You can look at subsequent citation by other innovators. Uh, uh, this tells you that these are not regarded as high quality patents. Or you can look at firms' own decision to renew patent. Firm has to pay a cost to renew patent. If, it's, if firm, uh, firms do not regard this as high quality, they will stop renewing it when subsidy uh, uh, decision uh, is made. 
all of those shows, these are low quality uh, 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 innovations. And our research suggests overall that the return uh, to those uh, industrial policy uh, is minus 19%, meaning on balance, the country will be better off uh, for not having this industrial policy. And why do we get uh, this uh, negative uh, returns? Not because there's no positive spillover. We identify there's positive spillovers, but this policy inspires a lot more resource waste uh, because uh, bureaucrats are not able to tell quality of the innovation. They can count the innovation, but they cannot tell the quality of the innovation that inspires many more firms to devote resources away from real innovation towards low quality innovations that help them to uh, 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 apply and, and receive a uh, subsidy. So the, so the, uh, the record on this industrial policy uh, perhaps is not, uh, not that great. I think this uh, should provide a cautionary tale, not just for those Chinese firm and, and bureau uh, uh, and, um, government officials enthusiastic about industrial policy, but, but perhaps for people in other countries uh, as well. So let me stop here. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Shang Jin. Uh, that was that was a great context. And uh, at this point, I'd like to invite all the panelists basically to to gather on our virtual stage together, so we can kind of address a, a few questions. And I'd also like to remind our audience um, that there is a question and answer box uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please feel free to submit some questions. We've already gotten a few really good ones that I look forward to to getting uh, to toward the end of our discussion here. Um, the first question I wanted to raise uh, for the panel is this question of um, what's become known as quote unquote selective decoupling, which is essentially the idea that the US can incentivize uh, some firms uh, in certain sectors of the Chinese economy to move their supply chains away from China or uh, to, to basically restrict some investment in some sensitive areas uh, going forward. So I wanted to ask uh, Jason actually uh, uh, put this question to him first and then invite uh, the rest of the panel to, to weigh in. Um, can you give us a, a sense, Jason, of um, you know, how this idea will, will work or could work, uh, how it is uh, being put into practice at, at this point, and um, how the export controls on semiconductors and things like that that you mentioned earlier factor into this. And then um, maybe if you want to take a crack at this, or maybe the panel could talk a little bit about um, how uh, China may respond to some of these moves by the U.S. So, um, Jason, if you want to start. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. I, I think this is an example of, of selective uh, controls. Um, you know, it's it's less than one percent of total trade. Uh, we're you know at an all time high in U.S. China trade. At the same time that these export controls um, have been instituted, uh, so I think we are we are seeing uh, playing out uh, an example where trade uh, by and large continues, um, but specific sectors that are believed to be highly sensitive and have enormous security risks. Um, are reserved. Um, as for what uh, China could do in retaliation, um, I don't think it has many great options in the semiconductor sector, um, whether there would be some sort of asymmetric response, for example, due to uh, critical minerals or rare earths, uh, would probably not work to China's long-term advantage and that it doesn't have uh, a sort of structural advantage um, in uh, mining rare earths, um, and it doesn't really have a long-term advantage in processing rare earths. Um, that would be pretty substitutable on short time horizons. Uh, so I, I don't think it has um, many great counter moves in related domains. Over. Yeah, um, Shang, Shang Jin, would you um, care to respond at all to the idea of selective decoupling and, and how China might react? Sure. The, I mean, the, uh, the desire to have selective uh, uh, decoupling is uh, uh, well uh, understood. Uh, there are a few costs that uh, one should uh, uh, point out. Uh, number one, why uh, it is true, like it's within a given sector, uh, given where China is in, term, in the se uh, semiconductor space, there's not much China can, uh, can do. However, the cost can uh, go beyond, uh, uh, beyond uh, that, uh, you know, number one, uh, you know, we live in a world in, in which uh, US, China, and other economies are very interrelated. What does that mean? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, virtually there's no single 
sophisticated product is today is produced entirely within one uh, country's uh, uh, border that we uh, that we have we live in multiple global supply chains uh, in virtually every single area one can think uh, think about us china tend to be and other countries tend to be on a common uh, supply chains you know apple boeing uh, uh, example of this every single apple product uh, involved participation of us Chinese firm and firm from uh, from uh, 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 elsewhere. So so decoupling can be very costly for these two countries, but as well for other countries. And number two, uh, importantly, the uh, you know the the the, the notion that uh, U.S. doing this, uh, 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 that China will just focusing on this one area uh, is uh, it, uh, um, might not uh, might not the whole that the, that the, uh, these um, uh, policies in semiconductor might make Chinese less willing to cooperate in other uh, yeah, areas, areas that, uh, that you know, that uh, should be of interest to, uh, you know, both countries and perhaps all countries, environmental uh, protection, biodiversity, uh, uh, nuclear proliferation, and all of those uh, uh, areas. That, that if the Chinese feel like, uh, if you talk to Chinese entrepreneurs, Chinese uh, uh, academics, uh, not just Chinese government officials, they, you, you have a sense that they feel like uh, there's unfair uh, strategy uh, pursued by the uh, pursued by the U.S. If they believe that uh, in their way, they might be much less willing to cooperate uh, elsewhere. And and number three, there's also a cost possibility of a spillover to building rule-based uh, trading system, rule-based other kind of a system. Uh, if uh, uh, you know uh, the top two economies uh, cannot cooperate uh, uh, effectively, the whole world uh, will suffer. Thanks, Shang. Changjin, um, I know that uh, I want to give uh, Pan Ler and, and Lee a chance to respond to this next question, which um, will sort of uh, follow on onto that, which is the question of uh, industrial policy. And, and there was a, a couple of questions from some audience members along these lines, both in the sort of domestic U.S. context, but also in the context of the U.S.-China relationship. So, you know, rightly or wrongly, uh, there is a view in the U.S., uh, particularly in the political realm, that uh, China's rise has come at the expense of, of U.S. prosperity or U.S. growth. Um, we're not going to address that question necessarily, but what I want to talk a little bit about and invite you to, to weigh in on is the question of industrial policy here in the U.S. So um, there were some, some good comments earlier, but one of the things that we've seen recently is, is, is a willingness to employ some of these uh, policies in order to both reshore or, or uh, make more robust our domestic semiconductor manufacturing here in the US, but also to sort of provide more of a manufacturing base and employment base overall. Um, so I wanted to ask Pan Le to speak a little bit about her experience researching Chinese industrial policy and where it's worked and where it hasn't worked and, and, and maybe ask Lee to follow up with that to, to kind of put that in the domestic US context. I'm not saying that you know, our, China, our China policy here in the US is going to fix all of the domestic manufacturing issues, but there, there does seem to be a kind of a win-win situation that the Biden administration has uh, pitched to voters that you know, we can take on China and we can also help our domestic uh, manufacturing industry. So I just wonder if uh, Pan Ler, if you you could, excuse me, start with that and then invite Lee to, to respond. Sure. Um, so, so I would like to, you know, perhaps draw on a few uh, successful lessons that we have learned. Um, so over the past decades, China has drastically increased its spending on R&Ds, expanded high ed education and vocational training, and built a modern transportation infrastructure. All of this, you know, all of this provided the crucial ingredients for the economy to take off. A well-trained, you know, cheap labor force, industrial capacity to absorb foreign technology, and roads and high-speed rail to transport goods and people. We are doing a lot of this, and we think we can do more. Um, some of the questions, you know, people ask what happens about manufacturing sector in, China, in the U.S. We, it, it firms moved left U.S. partly because the labor costs are high, and we don't have you know, um, a large number of you know, vocationally trained technicians that could perhaps help uh, with the transition. And so I think that could really help. 
And um, in terms of supporting a specific industry, you know, the one that some of the panels mentioned about uh, chips product and uh, semiconductor sector, I think it's important to pay attention to what I have described above, which is um, it's, it's important to avoid attracting and supporting inefficient firms and use counter cyclical policies when feasible, and then carefully choose the duration of the policy and, and minimize policy uncertainties. And I also would like to mention that um, from the pure efficiency perspective and economics considerations, it's better not to use industrial policies for other purposes, for example, you know, to create jobs or to solve social issues. The, some of my research in the past suggests that these jobs are very expensive, you know, partly because the industries that are targeted are capital intensive. And so to create jobs, it might be better to look at uh, frictions within the labor market uh, rather than using industrial policies to achieve this purpose. And, and then some of the you know, policies uh, discuss about the requirement for the subsidy recipients to purchase local goods, for example, US produced steel and iron. It doesn't seem, this doesn't seem to be the best, you know, I, I, um, idea uh, but you know um, partly because farms should be free to choose whatever goods you know at the cheapest price and highest quality possible if we want to support the u.s steel industry it might be better to actually target that directly rather than using the semiconductor subsidies you know uh, to achieve that purpose and last i would want to mention that perhaps we should avoid competition among the local governments and states um, state governments you know my analysis looking at china suggests that the competition among the provinces in china often comes at the cost of national interest rather than you know pro, um, um, promoting national interests um so i i know uh, lee also has a lot of work on this and and i want i want to stop here and then hear uh, hear about his comments yeah so, so i'd like to build directly on, on some of the things panla said uh, Daniel, I think industrial policy tends to get into difficulty when it really tries to uh, target and achieve specific market outcomes for specific firms and specific products. Uh, and this is also, I think, the kind of industrial policy that's most likely to generate um, you know, a reaction, a, a negative reaction from trading partners that could lead to countervailing policies that prevent the original policies from achieving their desired effect. It's often more efficient uh, and maybe just better to move the focus of policy upstream in exactly the way that Panla was talking about. So you know, investing in basic research and development, which is the foundation upon which industrial innovation builds, investing in education, and in a U.S. context, opening up our labor markets to the many millions of talented science and scientists and engineers around the world who would love to come here if we let them. I mean, the single biggest constraint to the advance of innovation in the United States is the limited number of people trained up to the level where they can do that, right? If we could focus our policies on those kinds of constraints, we can make ourselves, I think, more efficient, more productive, more powerful in the long run. And I think the same kind of advice might work well for China. What the most important book that I've read about China in the last five years is Invisible China, a book by Scott Rosell and Natalie Hell, that describes how China's created a really great public education system in its coastal cities. But the education system that exists in the rural interior right, and the social supports that, are, that exist there are really quite inadequate to prepare those children who are the majority of children in China for a bright future. Right? If both countries could move their locus of activity upstream, you know, focus on these you know, other elements of national strength and not try and focus on achieving particular market outcomes for particular products and firms, I think we might be able to limit our conflict and actually make both countries stronger in the long run. Thanks, Lee. There's a lot of really interesting uh, things in there to follow up on, um, but I'd like to give uh, Jason a chance to to address this question as well because I believe he he you know did some work with the Biden administration in in this area. And uh, if I've mischaracterized anything about the legislation or the intent, you know, please feel free to 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 correct me on that, Jason. But um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what your for your perspective, what the CHIPS Act and what some of these semiconductor activity is is meant to address and things that, that you think it is, has addressed well or could address well and some other things that, that you think, that, you know, could be improved upon in other ways? 
Yeah, I, I think that, you know, part of the goal is to de-risk the microelectronics supply chain that right now is dependent for over 90% of leading edge microelectronics on Taiwan, um, which is one of the most complicated places on the planet. Um, so having so much of uh, microelectronics manufacturing concentrated uh, in a very risky place um, over the next many years um, isn't a winning supply chain security strategy. So de-risking that by simply distributing um, advanced uh, microelectronics manufacturing makes a lot of sense. Whether to concentrate that in the United States or actually have a sort of cumulative distributed supply chain security strategy, I think is um, a more difficult question. I would argue that a distributed strategy makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's one that you can uh, build upon with your allies and partners um, in order to collectively um, ensure better better security. I agree with everything that Lee said, though. I mean, I think the, the fundamental drivers of uh, economic competitiveness are going to have to do with things like uh, high-skilled immigration. I mean, it's the United States' arguably most important um, asymmetric advantage is our ability to attract and retain global scientists and engineers who want to raise families here um, and not allowing uh, scientists and engineers to contribute to our own economy uh, seems like a very odd strategic choice. Um, there are other advantages that we have, our allies and partnerships. Um, we have more of them uh, than our competitors. Um, our universities, our role in uh, key supply chains such as semiconductors, um, but also others. Um, our role in standards organizations, our sort of soft power exerted through journals and conferences and uh, platforms, um, all of those are, are uh, I think, really important levers uh, for, uh, for industrial competitiveness that sort of exist outside of the typical toolkit. Thanks, Jason. Um, I want to go to some audience questions now because we're sort of running short of time. We've got about 12 minutes left, and um, there's some, some really good questions from the audience. And just a reminder that you can submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, there's a, it's a short question, but it's an important question uh, that was submitted by an audience member, which is, you know, how do we see, how does this panel see China's changing demographic profile having an impact on its long-term strategy and you know, how it competes with, with the U.S. and how the U.S. competes with China? Um, Pendler, I see, it uh, looks like you're interested in, in addressing this question. Um, let's go to you, and, and I'd like to invite Shang Jin also to, um, to speak a little bit about this. Okay, so um, I, I think the, uh, you know, uh, Lee has made a great comment, which is the, um, there's the China's landscape of education is highly unequal. And to the extent that this can be changed, or maybe China can tilt more resources toward the inland area and essentially educate the vast of, you know, students who are dropping out, who, are, who don't really have the opportunities to um, receive um, high ed education, vocational training, I think that would help to a great extent addressing the, you know, the aging, the, you know, the challenge that comes with a population that's fastly aging. Um, so I think that's perhaps one area that China can definitely improve. What's your question about the U.S.? Can you say one more? Uh, can you say it? Um, oh, sure. Um, so you know, given the fact, so, you know, up until this point, the U.S. has, you know, broadly speaking, viewed China as a growth juggernaut, both in terms of its economic growth, but also its population growth. And a changing demographic profile, uh, uh, you know, perhaps not seeing the level of growth that we've become accustomed to thinking China will, will see, uh, how does that change the U.S. strategic uh, calculus, if, if at all? And um, you know, Jason or Shang Jin, if you, if you wanted to weigh in on this too, or, or, or Pendler, you're certainly welcome to as well, but just kind of curious how that all kind of factors into it. So it's a jump ball, any, any, anyone can take it. Uh, do you want me to comment on the demographics first? Uh, sure, sure, okay. please. So uh, uh, in my view, China actually faces two uh, separate but also related the demographic challenges. Uh, one is the uh, age structure imbalance, the other is sex ratio uh, imbalance. Age structure imbalance is otherwise known as aging, that the share of the 16 above it, uh, in populations rising, uh, 
uh, that's a problem uh, because uh, uh, correspondingly, the working age cohort uh, uh, growth rate has been negative uh, for, for uh, close to be a decade by, by now. This leads to a progressively lower uh, potential growth rate and uh, many things will come with declining uh, potential uh, uh, growth rate. That's one uh, very important uh, uh, challenge uh, for Chinese economy and society. In principle, there are a few ways to deal with it. Uh, uh, China has ridiculously early official retirement age, so they can do something to postpone a retirement age, official retirement age is 55 for men, 54 women, for majority of them, way too uh, early relative to uh, current Chinese life uh, expectancy. China can do a better job uh, in uh, uh, upgrading the skills of the labor force, improving education, not just uh, you know, getting more people to go to college in coastal areas, but as Li uh, and uh, uh, Pamela uh, pointed out, do more to spread uh, you know, high school education, base education in inland rural uh, area. China, can do, uh, China is already doing, uh, investing aggressively in robotics. Um, and China, uh, number, number three and uh, uh, number four, uh, more open immigration policy, which China currently is not doing. There's a lot of resistance to do that, but perhaps China should open its mind up to the possibility of a more open uh, uh, immigration and, and policy. Finally, uh, uh, you know, improving uh, what's called the total factor productivity is very important. And when people think, think about the improving uh, productivity, we we'll think about innovation. But it's not just innovation. Various kinds of reforms are reducing misallocation. So for example, making sure dynamic, efficient private sector firms have equal access to resources as state-owned firms is one of the ways to improve productivity that can counteract the challenge of the aging uh, society. So that's on aging. On a gender issue imbalance, uh, uh, you know, let's talk about uh, in the West, but it's equally important. Uh, Chinese uh, 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 boys to girls ratio at birth is an abnormally high, uh, 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 resulting roughly one out of every nine young men uh, they cannot find a girlfriend or wife. So this relative shortage of brides uh, inspire many, many problems, some economical, some social. In the, on the economic side, this, my, uh, my other research suggests this leads to a, a, a notable rise in household savings, which is an important contributor to Chinese trade surplus against US and other countries. So it's something that uh, 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 less well understood uh, uh, by perhaps uh, uh, media and politicians, but, but that's actually one way, uh, one important uh, thing. Socially, clearly it's a problem that you have a lot of uh, young men who want to get married, but cannot get uh, uh, married. That's also a challenge that needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Maybe I'll stop here, please. Um, thanks, Zhang, Zhang Jin. Um, is there anyone else who, uh, Lee, Jason, wants to address this question of changing demographics and how that fits into the strategic um, approach? If, if, if not, let's maybe we can just sort of, we got about five minutes left here, and uh, I think we'll probably um, should zoom out a little bit and just kind of basically ask the main question here, which is, um, are there better ways of managing the U.S.-China competition? And uh, I think to, to sort of put a finer point on that, um, what I would ask is, is this a zero sum game? Um, does one side have to win? Does one side have to lose? Or is there another way to look at this? Um, I think Lee didn't get a chance to respond on that last round. So let's start with you. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, if we could hear from, from everyone uh, before we close the session. Uh, sure, Daniel. Uh, maybe I could just reiterate a point that I tried to make earlier, which is that I think that the conflict is going to be sort of maximized when both sides are focusing on policies that are targeted at ensuring particular market outcomes for particular products and particular firms. You know, that does have a zero sum element to it. And even when a policy succeeds, you know, success could actually generate countervailing policies and we could wind up in this kind of arms race, right? Where we're you know, stuck in this dynamic of escalating market interventions that distort the global print a trading system that actually potentially could tear it apart um, and neither side could win, right? Our, alternatively, we could move that focus upstream and both countries could focus on the things that can make them stronger in the long run and that can build on their existing strengths, right? So China's great asset is its huge population. And if it could just invest more in ensuring that all those people have adequate education, 
healthcare, you know, the entrepreneurs, you know, that are becoming a force to be reckoned with in the world have the freedom um, and the resources uh, to compete. Um, then I think, you know, China could realize its, you know, goal of becoming a more sophisticated, wealthier country, even as it copes with these demographic challenges. Likewise, the United States could focus on its domains of asymmetric strength, right? Inviting more highly skilled immigrants, like two of my fellow panelists, to bring their energy and their talent and their wisdom into our country and into our society. Uh, and we could focus on our world-class research universities, you know, at which a number of our, our panelists are employed, right? Um, you know, which are also a major source of strength. And these are ways that both countries could make themselves more productive, wealthier, better, Right, uh, but uh, it wouldn't bring us into into direct conflict, in particular markets. And I think that shift, moving conflict upstream, would be a better way to manage the competition. If I could give an example supporting what Lee says, in a concrete area in which you can see uh, one does not need to be bogged down by uh, you know uh, zero sum uh, thinking is cooperation in industrial policy that the uh, uh, industrial policy in environmental areas, climate change, biodiversities, where uh, the world can benefit from, you know, collective, you know, more public investment in those uh, uh, area, driving down the cost of renewable energy, driving down the cost of other, uh, you know, more climate friendly uh, technologies. Currently, so, so the, the US electric vehicle uh, legislation is a counter example to that. It's, you know, it has, lofty goal, but many concrete causes are building sort of a protectionist uh, uh, measures ha having a very strong zero sum and flavor. They will lead to more wasteful use of US taxpayers' money and, and producing smaller benefit for the whole uh, whole world. I think that's an area in which a lot more cooperation uh, can be uh, can be had that will lead to collective, uh, collective positive sum outcome. I, I do think there's an inherent tension in that um, the less than 1% of China that controls the country um, has a zero sum attitude towards its own population. Um, and that's that's just hard to square with the other goals that we have um, for uh, the prosperity of China's people, which I'm deeply in favor of. But I think unfortunately, um, China's government um, has rebuffed various forms of confidence building measures, including nuclear weapons discussions, a functioning crisis hotline between the US and Beijing, formal track one dialogues on safeguards related to use of AI systems. We should keep trying, um, but I do think the probability of war has increased due to China's growing confidence in its military modernization. And that modernization has been fueled by US technologies sold to China. So I think that selective technology controls are going to have to be part of our risk reduction measures. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I know, Pendler, we haven't been able to, to get to you on this question, but we're about to wrap up the panel. It's, we're at time. Uh, certainly a, a sobering uh, thought to end on from Jason, but I think uh, a, a good one and um, well taken. And uh, I think Overall, uh, a very interesting discussion today, and I'd just like to thank the panelists, of course, and uh, and our audience members um, for for tuning in. Um, if there's any final thoughts, please feel free to share them. Otherwise, I think we'll we'll, we'll have to uh, leave it there for now. Thank you.